All right, guys. I hope everyone has a, had a good share of pizza. Um, we'll move on to the second talk now. We'll have uh, Paul Savage. I hope that's the right name. Okay. Um, <laughs> so Paul's going to talk about can the business and uh, the architecture be friends? That's all they can. I suppose. First of all, what's this got to do with microservices? First of all, right? So. We'll, we'll just talk a little bit about that, okay? So, people here don't use Node. What, what do you use? Ruby, Java, Java. Ruby, Java. Okay, cool. So, and do you use microservices? Are you actually actively using them in production? More than two people nodding hands yet. Yeah. Well, what do you like? What, why do you do it? Discrete. Hmm? It's discrete. It's okay, cool. Discrete. Okay. So well, there's a couple of reasons that we really like it. Um, some of them are not particularly relevant here. Things like more, you, know, you can break code in smaller pieces. They're more maintainable. You get less coupling. All the bits and pieces that Peter covered. Um, so uh, one of the the uh, there's a couple of things. When you actually do microservices properly, you get um, kind of a nicer coupling uh, between. Uh, the business goals and the actual software architecture itself. Okay, so uh, it's it's easier to match back what you're trying to achieve from a business perspective. Okay, um, obviously uh, software architectures can be implemented more quickly, um, and the architecture is more flexible to accommodate changing business needs. So that, that kind of is kind of what Peter illustrated with the sales tax example the last way. We've seen it in many different places where uh, the business changes in some unexpected way and you can handle it better if you've taken a microservices architecture approach. Okay? Unfortunately, uh, we've got a friend, Melvin. Um, do you know about the Conway uh, principle or have you ever come across this? The idea that um, uh, it doesn't matter how good we are at software, um, the, the platform we're building will eventually echo the, the, the company we're building it for or within. Okay? And it's actually very, very true. Um, so the, uh, when you're when you're actually designing systems and building systems that support business processes, the way the business processes run, the communications uh, have an impact on your architecture. Couple them, okay? So you end up with an architecture reflecting your organization in some way, okay? Um, is this a good thing? Um, well, one of I mean, in this particular case, I don't think microservices are any any good at all. So you've got a more flexible basis uh, for architecture. So you've got new and improved ways to get it wrong. Okay. Um, you've got these. Uh, so an awful lot of newer technologies people use when they're coding uh, microservices allow developers to move faster. Okay. So it's um, for me, moving faster is all about uh, higher level languages that allow you to implement the same thing with less lines of code. So you get less bugs. Our quality move faster. Um, all very, very good. Um, unfortunately, if you're not moving in the right direction, you can move faster away from your goal as well. Okay? And, uh, and then there's the whole thing about matching the business. So the current principle kicks in a little bit that if you have um, uh, an ill thought out business process and you're not aware of that and you try to capture business requirements and implement against them and architect for them, you bring all the chaos from the business into your code base. Okay? And what I want to do is um, <coughs> uh, just we kind of we wanted to talk about this a little bit because um, Nearform gets called in on a few different occasions, right? Normally we get called in when everything is on fire, okay? So somebody has come up with a great idea, normally the CEO, okay? They have uh, decided this is the key initiative for this year. They have decided they want to take a completely different approach. They've heard about maybe some new technologies, or they're, they're talking to a CTO, and the CTO wants to find an excuse to start playing with newer technologies. And they create the greatest spaghetti code bundle on the planet. And uh, a couple of months before this is due to be announced at the annual conference or whatever else, you're calling, and, and nothing works, right? So, um, the kind of it always, uh, and, they, and they always blame, like, oh, God, the engineering is rubbish. God, we didn't get experienced enough engineers, you know, whatever else. And, and, and certainly that is the case sometimes, right? So 
this mixed set of everybody, you know. So, uh, but a lot of the time, actually, what we find is that the the confusion around some of the aspects of the business just creeps into the code and the architecture. Okay. So I want to talk about one specific case. And um, you think get away without the microphone? Sorry, I'll repeat it. I'll double it or something. But much more uh, insightful. Can everybody hear me without the microphone? Yep. Okay. Cool. So. Um, so we're working with a, a, a provider there, an enterprise platform developer in North America. They develop for a lot of the big household names that we all deal with. And it was kind of a, a magic project, right? They came in and they said, right, well, we are working on a very old system. We need to move to a very new system and that is more in line with our new business needs. And we're not going to bother trying to migrate or anything like that. We're just going to toss everything out. We can just start from scratch, greenfield development, do what you want, go crazy design from the scratch base. And for the most part, actually, most of the system uh, came together beautifully. It was really, really nice, okay? Um, uh, one of the things, though, um, is that the, this, the, the reason they were selling it both, say, their competitors is that they had this idea of this incredibly customized feel. So you felt like you were getting customized software, even though it was based off a platform, okay? Anybody who's not laughing now should be, if you're an experienced engineer, that's not possible, right? So, it's, you cannot, you cannot get this, right? So, if you try, you pay the price, okay? So, when you try and, and, and achieve everything and, and get this wonderfully uh, flexible system that will meet every possible business requirement that anybody can come with at any future juncture, right? What you get, right, is, an incredibly complicated system to try and cater for every possible imagined future that the, the client throws at chess scenarios. Okay, your maintainability, and even if you can spell it, sorry, terrible, and maintainability just gets destroyed, and the, the the you lose performance as well because you're trying to cater for too much. It's very very hard to choose specific scenarios. Okay, and um, uh, that was exactly what happened here, and um, so. Uh, most of you, do you come across user access roles, access control lists, all that kind of usual stuff? Some people shouldn't be allowed to do some things, in, right? And sometimes that's, you know, it's a by the by, you know, it's, it's a nice to have, and in some systems it's fairly critical. But the data these guys use, uh, they have particularly sensitive data, okay? And they, they, they deal with data in every layer of these big organizations. And it's really important that somebody at the bottom doesn't see something sensitive that should only be seen by somebody at the top. And you know, there's all sorts of um, wonderful port systems in America if they do. So this is this is the stress part, okay? And they, you know, the, the, the idea of a role is very straightforward. I am this type of I'm an assistant administrator. I can do just about everything, okay? I'm somebody who does data entry, I'm allowed to maybe put stuff in, I'm not allowed to change anything, I'm not allowed to read anybody else's data. Okay? I'm a mid-level manager, I'm access to anybody's data who's in my area, in my group, whatever else. Right? So you've got these, these kind of classifications right, of, of, kind of who can access what and who can do what with various data and various functions. Okay? So, um, Relatively simple for one organization, one website, whatever else, right? Think of a platform that has to cater for, let's call it uh, two to three hundred different companies with different structures and all their different access control rules, generic, okay? Right? So they're all different. So some people, uh, they use it based on region, some people it's based on their groups, some people it's based on their title, and uh, then they, they, they started getting into more more difficult things. So in, in some particular things, uh, you know, uh, one one person might choose to share information with another person when we put them on a need to know list. And they obviously got blacklisting, which is everywhere in the world. And uh, very often, even people who weren't allowed to read very many cases were allowed to read them if they happened to have been the one that entered them. Okay, so there's all sorts of these kind of things that come together. And and uh, we actually looked at it, and you know, the, the, the just, yeah, so you get, you get all this 
kind of coming in here, right? But the reality is that any one of these systems isn't particularly hard, right? So you, how many people have actually implemented any kind of access control system? One, two, three, four, five. So, so it's straightforward. There are known approaches. Okay, they're accepted. Was it difficult? Was it So, um, what had happened here was very, very interesting, right? So they had a, a really simple system when they started, which was 17 years ago, okay? And they had this lovely Excel spreadsheet, and it was really, really simple. You kind of, it was a, you know, you're your user, and there's this operation, and you go yes or no, right? Okay? Really easy to implement. I mean, every code is free, right? And then the requirements started getting more complex. But the, the business felt that the format to capture requirements just stay the same, right? Because this is working, we give these spreadsheets to developers, they turn into wonderful code that works, excellent, right? So the business, the, the business analysts and the people who were working with the customers were coming across these complex things. So they came up with, they're, they're clever people as well, so they came up with really clever ways of expressing very complex rules, okay? So, well, we were actually, when we came into the company, we were seeing um, a spreadsheet. Uh, it might have 1,400 columns, and it might have seven rows, and about 75% of all the columns, there wasn't yes or no in there, there's conditional stuff, right? Okay? And they're, they're, they're also, when you're taking requirements that big, it takes a few months to c collect the requirements. So some of the requirements may be um, not quite obviously, but conflict with other parts of the requirements directly. Um, and then some of them are just very amb ambiguous, right? Okay. So, um, so again, you had this wonderful system where BAs are being forced to work inside the system. They had found inventive ways of getting around. It's also quite a team of BAs. So this is a reasonably big company, right? And every individual BA had developed their own system. So they had different notations, right? So they found that like developers work better with one or more BAs, that's what they were telling us when they came in. And it turned out that it's just that after a while of working with somebody, you knew what they meant, right? When they put some random into a spreadsheet, right? Okay? Uh, so basically, um, BA goes off, works with a customer for months, gather these requirements. Um, uh, it's like all businesses, right? The customer decides to buy. So the development team were tasked to come up with an implementation in about, you know, the usual 12 weeks, whatever it is, right? It's time to finish. So it's no problem, it's gonna, it's gonna come together. Um, so, um, what the guys did originally um, was to design this wonderful, flexible ACL model. So you can kind of slowly map that entire massive spreadsheet into fairly complex rules. Um, uh, so it was, it was using kind of a sufficient required kind of a, an approach to access control if you're used to that sort of thing. So, you know, if you're, um, if you're a system administrator, it's sufficient, right? You're, you're able to access everything. And if you're, if you're a, a manager, it's required that this particular thing is in your region. And implemented as a service, as its own microservice, right? Which sounded like a good idea at the start, but it didn't really work. And, um, uh, and then also you have these things, so sometimes in there you've got your CRUD operations, right, which are one way of doing things, and then you have, like, when you have to try and search and filter stuff, you have to take a completely different approach to the access control, because the, the sensitive data is containing some of the headers you get back when you search, right? But typically on these kind of systems, um, they're fairly large data systems, so you can't have, you can't have the same implementation, it just won't scale to what you, you need to sift through for the search, so you have to optimize the index and stuff. Um, uh, absolute nightmare. So, uh, as you can imagine, um, uh, the initial thing was terrible, uh, awful performance, and just pattern matching against strings. It doesn't really matter what you, language you're in. That's just wrong. Um, very, very difficult to validate. So, if you think about um, one of the questions that the QA team have to answer before this thing goes out is, is there any chance that the wrong person is going to get to look at the wrong data? Right? Okay? And like some of the systems, uh, these systems create a lot of very, very sensitive data with a lot of kind of big corporate dirty laundry in them, right? So the answer has to be no. I'm 100% sure there is no chance, right? And we went through one of the simpler systems, and uh, there's about, uh, we think about 22,500 pathways through the code, 
right? So um, that's an interesting test thing in itself, which is okay if you can if you can actually just mark it all out. But the way that the requirements are specified is very very uh, difficult to build a kind of a test harness to actually replicate all the different user paths, right? Uh, and then, uh, of course, the configuration maintenance, um, 1400 uh, lines of configuration. Um, I don't know how many, what's the current bug to code ratio? So what, is it bug every 40 lines of code on average or something? Is that, uh, is that what's, that is smiling. <laughs> you do better or worse than that, I don't know. But anyway, that's an awful lot of lines of configuration and no matter how good or bad you are, that's a huge number of potential mistakes. So, so um, <coughs> horrific all around. Anyway, so, uh, um, we don't really mind because with a lot of these problem domains, the easiest way is to try and build it. Have you heard about the kind of um, uh, engineers versus five-year-olds thing with Lego? So they, they, they it's, it was just a, a little experiment they carried out, right? So they, they got a lot of uh, five-year-olds in a room and they got a lot of engineers in a room and they asked them to build the biggest tower with some Lego, right? And the engineers thought about it, they planned out what they were going to do, and they built these wonderful towers, right? Five girls don't approach it like that at all. Five girls go bang, 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 fall over. Hmm. Okay, bang, 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 okay, we'll use a different approach, right? Five girls are actually, uh, I think in about, I think it was just over half the cases the five girls outperformed the engineers because they, they, they use a trial and error, right? So they just keep going until they get something that works, okay? So it's kind of, it's, 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 it's uh, some of the thinking that we do around software, like right? the, using text bytes to validate certain approaches and things like that. So we weren't too worried we got it wrong. We measured the results, we had a look at the assumptions, and um, yeah, it's very clear and really obvious um, you know, what we had to do, right? So uh, one of the key challenges though was the, the complications were coming through in the way the requirements were being specified. So uh, even though the problem itself isn't inherently complex, ACL is an understood domain, you can kind of control it, you can implement it well. Uh, in this particular context, it's a monstrously complex uh, situation, right? So, um, we were actually able to come up with a different approach. Um, we, we, we switched to using it and building it as a module that other services could use rather than its own service for various reasons. It makes it, makes it easier to manage and get into the like service architecture. Um, uh, and again, um, the, Trusted computer-based approach, you know that thing where you reduce it down to the smallest size to give it the least chance of going wrong? You can use it in, in kernels and computers. So, um, the idea is that the most critical part of the system you make with the shortest lines of code, so it's the most maintainable and the most robust. You know, right? um, and so we did this, we pulled it back. Um, so, and, and that's absolutely fine. I mean, it, it, it's actually quite a simple little implementation. It's, trivial compared to the last implementation, much less uh, coding skill and architecture skill to get it right. Um, we do have a, a small problem though because it still requires pretty much God to map this set of requirements right down, down to this simple implementation. Uh, and we also had the testing issue still, right? So there were, you know, the, even with this particular way, if you approach test it in the way that you implement it, all you do is test your implementation. So, you know, you need to get a way of actually modeling user behavior, making sure you cover it all. So, so uh, we actually came to the conclusion that the solution, the simplest solution, the simple implementation was possible, would work, but we couldn't efficiently do it in this ecosystem, right? So we were. I'm actually really looking at this project that um, uh, it's, it's quite a technical company and, and they're actually quite, they're very, very open to discussing all sorts of things. So uh, we actually went in and we started talking about the way it was going to be implemented and uh, actually worked with them to help uh, rejig their requirements gathering process and their, the way they express their requirements, right? And it was quite interesting actually because once they once they realized you know why things were getting so hard and you know this is a business that has been going over seven years really successfully and and suddenly projects were taking longer right and, and this is kind of one of the reasons why that these this, these complexities have crept in right um, uh, and it was brilliant they, they actually um, uh, they the guys got it 
they they changed the way they were doing things. The BAs changed their their documentation set. They worked with the developers to actually improve the communication there. Absolutely fantastic. And so what we actually <coughs> through the whole process, uh, they suddenly realised that all their customers hated these documents as well. They couldn't really understand or grasp this 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 with this massive spreadsheet and with these all these uh, you know kind of hundreds of pages of BRDs. Uh, business requirement definition documents and all that. So we had much, much easier requirements capture, much easier to communicate with the customers what the kind of the particular access control mechanisms actually were. Right? Better communications between the, the business analysts and, and the devs that are actually putting together the projects. Q18 can now actually build tests to run against it, which is much easier. And the um, well, the easy implementation is trivial compared to the, the mad kind of coding that was going previously. Um, so, so far so good. So, uh, um, I think the, the, just very, very interesting because, you know, previous to this, um, how, how many of you used um, uh, Domino in Anger? Or Lotus Notes or any of that? Or the technology as well. So, um, yeah, so they 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 have been using quite um, prescriptive approaches inside boundaries that were well defined for them, right? And w within those that context, these previous approaches actually made sense, right? One of the challenges when we went outside that and we started using microservices, all this freedom opened up the freedom to get things wrong as well. But actually, when we started realizing there was increasing complexity over here, and it was coming from here, it actually helped them with their business as well. So from our perspective, it was an interesting um, kickback of microservices that the actual change uh, to the, the simplified architecture helped them echo that back across the organization. So it's like the common principle working in reverse, really. So uh, anyway, just sort thought of it'd be interesting just to share it. So uh, yeah, they can be friends. Uh, just be aware, though, because if you hang around with their own friend, it becomes very bad habits. So, yeah. OK. Thank you.